Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we share all things people stuff in leadership. Learn from leaders who have done the hard yards and learn from experience. Hear from expert authors about the latest insights from culture to strategy and messy people dynamics. Get tips and insights from multiple award-winning author and leadership expert herself, Zoe Routh. Now, on with the show. Hi, it's Zoe, and my question for you today is, what if you thought you were doing a great job as a leader, you're doing all the right things, and yet it turns out what you were really doing was diminishing people, making them being less effective and less productive at work. All of your good intentions, meh. (laughs) It's kind of a sobering thought, right? You think you're doing the right thing. You have all these great skills that you've picked up as a leader, and then they're falling quite short. Well, my guest today is none other than the best-selling author of Multipliers, Liz Wiseman herself. I was super excited to get Liz on the show. I'm a big fan of her work. I bought Multipliers for all of the amplifiers to study this quarter. We've been dissecting it and implementing it, and it's been a huge, powerful insight into how we can do things better. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about Liz. She's a researcher and executive advisor, and she teaches leadership to executives around the world. Some of her recent clients include, oh, all the big guns, Apple, AT&T, Disney, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Nike, Salesforce, Tesla, and Twitter. Oh my God, what an amazing client list. So you know she's doing quite well. She has been listed on the Thinkers 50 and in 2019 was recognized as the top leadership thinker in the world. Her book is amazing. It's deep, it's thorough, it's elegant, it's useful and practical, and she's got quizzes around it and videos to support her work. So you can just get a huge ton of intelligence and practical application of this concept of being a multiplier. She's the author of several books, including the New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter, awesome book, The Multiplier Effect, Tapping the Genius Inside Our Schools, and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Rookie Smarts, Why Learning Beats Knowing in the New Game of Work. And as we recorded this, she was in the middle of writing her next book, which we'll talk about towards the end of the interview. What I think you're going to get out of today's interview is all about the accidental stuff. What are you doing that's not quite right? How can you catch yourself at that? Are there any prerequisites that you need in order to step up and to be a multiplier? Okay, and a heap of other really cool stuff. All right, if you love this episode as much as I loved interviewing Liz, please leave us a review or make a comment or send me an email, zoe at intercompass.com.au. Would love to hear from you. All right, let's get on with the show. Oh my goodness, I've been so excited about this podcast interview for ages. I'm so thrilled to have Liz Wiseman on the show. Welcome, Liz. Oh, Zoe, it's good to be here. (laughs) Well, I know that you're a tough gal to get a hold of, and you're such a seasoned, experienced author and professional in the field of leadership development and team development. And I've been, as I was telling you before we hit record, I've been immersed in your book, Multipliers, for the last week or so, unpacking it, analyzing it, blogging about it. (laughs) And it's the book that we've bought for my own group called Amplifiers as their quarterly book that they're going to study and implement as well. So that's the big sort of ramp up to having you on the show. And I'm so thrilled you're here. Well, Zoe, with you doing work on amplifying and me doing work on multiplying, like this conversation is destined to happen. (laughs) Yeah. And the name of my group is based on Matt Church's book, Amplifiers. He actually wrote a book called Amplifiers. And I asked him before I named the group, can I use that? Are you okay with that? And he said, sure. And it's the same, like he's got a similar principle that the act of um, the act of speakership is leadership. And when we speak our message, it broadcasts and influences others. So I'm really on this theme of how are we showing up and how are we influencing others. And I'm curious about your interest in this field. Like, how did you first get interested in thinking about leaders and how they can influence others? You know, 
I've often wondered that. Like in some ways, I don't know how I got here. I just started doing work I enjoyed doing and it got me here. But, um, you know, my, it might've been because I was just born bossy. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't take much for me to move into a leadership job. Like no one needs to offer it to me. I'm the kind of person who maybe is aligned a little too tight on the proactive, but if I'm in a room and no leader emerges, I'm really pretty quick to say, oh, I'll fulfill that role. So I think in some ways it was just the act of signing up to lead groups that got me interested in leadership because I probably signed up to manage and lead well before I knew what I was doing. So I had to learn it as I was doing it. And I actually had a very interesting experience early on in my career. I came out of uh, graduate school. I wanted a job teaching leadership. And how I knew I wanted to do that, I have no idea, but I did. And so I wanted to come back to the Bay Area. I reached out to a company that was one of the premier management training firms at the time, Zanger Miller. They were actually founded in the Bay Area. And I just phoned up the president and was like, hi, I'm Liz. I would like to come and work for you. And like, wouldn't you surely want to hire me? And <laughs> Ed Musselwhite was the president at the time. And, and he said to me, like, he kind of patted me on the head and he's like, Liz, I see your resume here. I am sure you're great. And I just know I'm going to regret this years from now. But if you want to teach leadership, maybe you should go get some leadership experience. Like, <laughs> like maybe you should go be a manager. And I'm like, what a terrible idea. Like, <laughs> like, clearly Ed does not understand this is what I want to do. And, you know, I, I don't know that I tried to convince him because I could see like, okay, that's not my plan. He's not like, he's not on the plan, but you know, maybe that is a better plan. And so I ended up taking not the job I wanted, but like my backup job was to go and work for Oracle a database company, a software company, and they were young and rapidly growing. And I took a job kind of coordinating training for one of the divisions. And it was growing really fast. And like, I, I think I'd only been there a year, year and a half when they're like, you know, we actually need someone to manage training for the entire company. And Liz, we want you to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I remember what Ed said, go get some experience managing. And unfortunately I was working teaching at the time inside Oracle. I was teaching programming, which is not what I wanted to teach, but I was enjoying that. And so I'm like, I don't wanna go get some stupid management job. I like teaching. <laughs> and so I was kind of turning it down and um, my would be boss, he was like, no, we want you to do this. like. Not like I didn't have a choice, but he's like, no, we really need you to take this job. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Ed said, go get management experience. OK, managing seems like less fun than teaching, but I'll go do it. And turned out I loved it, spent the next 16 years managing various departments, groups, divisions inside of Oracle and, and really got thrown into that job at a young age. So I wanted to teach management, but I ended up managing the teaching function inside of Oracle. So I was doing exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. But you know, Ed was right later. I think I'm a much better researcher and educator because I've actually done the job of leading. Oh, yeah, you've got all the, the scars and the triumphs along the way. A lot of scars, you know, and, and I feel like I, I come at it with a very different level of empathy because I've had to do the hard things. Um, I've had to, I remember a day where I had to lay off a hundred people out of one group. Like those are tough days, you know, having to make decisions about like shutting down groups and starting up groups elsewhere. And like, when you go through those, and, and I remember I had one, one day, um, you know, I had to fire or terminate the employment of someone who was like the sister to the CEO of the company. And like, you know, it was it, like, I've had to do a lot of hard things. Yeah. I don't know how you managed that one. Anyone else, but just like, I don't approach it from a theoretical point of view. I approach it from, yeah, I've had to manage a lot of those hard trade-offs and I understand 
that this is not as simple as a textbook might make it seem. Oh, yeah. I think that's that's a really useful point, you know, because you can have a nice little framework of how you might, you know, sack 100 people. <laughs> and the emotion that goes along with that is a different story altogether. And people don't necessarily respond according to the textbook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what did you love about your management roles? You know, I think I, I really like, like directing a team of people to go do something like that you can do something bigger and harder than you could ever do on your own. You know, that's fun. Like big challenges. It's like, okay, that's a much bigger challenge than I could ever figure out. But sort of like together we can do harder things. That's a fun and rewarding part. Uh, I, you know, I think I'm like in my soul, I am very much an educator and a coach. Like I really love seeing people learn like I my first book has a great big light bulb on the cover and you know I think I really love the light bulb moment like where someone goes oh I get it and you know you can do that in a classroom and I started by teaching people how to like program in third generation like languages but you also do that sitting across the table from someone you work with and helping them grow like that's that's kind of fun. Mm. Uh, well, your first, I think it was your first book called Rookie Smarts. Is that right? Was it the first one? Well, you would think it was the first one because it's got that rookie name of like first time, but that's actually my third book. Multipliers was my first book. Multipliers was your first one. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Amazing. I love multipliers. I'm looking forward to getting into Rookie Smarts and we'll talk about your upcoming one a little bit later. When you started doing the research that went into the book for multipliers, what was the most surprising thing you discovered in your research? I'll start with the small, like the small discovery I had doing the research and then the, the, probably the two big surprise findings from the research. So, you know, in this research, I am trying to understand why some leaders seem to amplify intelligence around them and others crush it, essentially. You know, like, why are we smart and capable around some leaders and not around others? It's an observation that I had from early on at Oracle. Like, wow, I'm surrounded by all these really smart people, like brilliant. And some of them, like, I've seen that brilliant person be absolutely amazing and at their best around leader A. But then, you know, the next day I see them in a meeting with a different executive and they're what seems to be a different person. I'm like, what happened to my friend Jack? Like, I know Jack is brilliant, but I just watched Jack like crash and burn in that meeting. Like what was going on there? And so I'm trying to understand, you know, how is it in terms of the way leaders think and act that has this either multiplying or diminishing effect on others. And as part of the research, I was asking people to describe the behavior of two very different kinds of leaders, someone around whom you're brilliant, someone around whom you couldn't get anything done, et cetera. And I wanted them to describe the behavior. And then I wanted them to describe the mindsets. Like, what did that manager think? What did he or she assume to be true? And so I thought, oh, well, yeah, people can describe behavior. But when I ask people to describe the mindsets of leaders, they're going to look at me like I've lost my mind. Like, how would they know? And if I asked, you know, anyone listening, like to think back around a leader you were at your best around and then one that you really held back around, like you could probably think about their behavior, but like, what was their mindset? I thought people would struggle with this. And strangely, Zoe, I was exactly wrong about this, that people struggled to remember their behavior. Like, you know, what did Mark do that like brought out the worst in me or cause me like, hmm. But when I asked them to describe what did they believe to be true, they said, oh yeah, he believed that no one on the team was as smart as he was. Oh, he believed that it was his job to have the answers. They were quick about it. And I just thought it's interesting that when we think back on our experience with executives or frontline leaders, that we can ascertain their beliefs so quickly. Like it's what we remember the most is like, what was the assumption that this person had? An assumption that's never spoken. It just um, oozes out. It kind of like in some ways, like the message to leaders is, you know, the people who work for you, 
they know what you're thinking. <laughs> mm. This guy can't find his way out of a bag, you know? <laughs> Even if you're doing all the right things, like that assumption you have about the capability of that person and the team, it's out in the open. Yeah, yeah. You're not as uh, closed off as you think you are. No. And, and if you really like believe, like I found these multipliers believe that, you know what, people are smart. They're going to figure it out. Like people can tell and they will respond to that assumption. So that was kind of the first thing that surprised me. It's like, oh, wow, I wouldn't have thought it would unfold that way. But the two big findings from the research was one was how big the difference is between what these multiplier leaders and diminisher leaders get from other people. Like, you know, I found out a lot about how they think and what they do, but what I found was that these diminishing leaders, you know, these are leaders who kind of tell people what to do. They micromanage, um, you know, they might hire smart people, but they underutilize them that they were getting less than half of people's intelligence, available intelligence. And 48% was what came out of this research. Now I did it, you know, blind. So people didn't have these terms, diminishers and multipliers, just when they analyze these scenarios. And that was like the first big aha. And probably because I come from this background of being a corporate executive and, you know, having to hire hundreds of people and like manage large pools of resources and big budgets you know, I run the corporate university, so we, we spent a lot of money. And my first reaction was, wow, like, who would hire a really smart person? And then, like, who would pay a dollar and only get 48 cents of value out of that dollar? And then it's like, well, when I found out that these multiplier leaders get virtually all of people's capability, and then maybe even a little bit more, as, as people say, they grow around them. I'm like, well, wait a minute. So with just a little bit better leadership... I could essentially like double my workforce at no cost. Like I could take the 300 people who work for me and get sort of 600 and I don't have to go ask anyone for approval and I don't have to spend a dime to do that. That seems like a pretty good, like why would you hire smart people and diminish them? Yeah. When you could hire people and, and really get everything out of them. I'm like, okay, that there's some basic economics there that are compelling. That was my first kind of surprise was how big that gap was. It's quite a considerable thing. Yeah, it's 2X. Mm. And, you know, when I started the research, my hypothesis was that, you know, these multiplier leaders, they get more, like, I don't know, maybe 20% more, 25, 2X. The, the other big surprise was that most of the diminishing that's happening in, in our workplaces, it's not coming from the tyrannical, know-it-all, bossy, bully type leader. It's coming from what I call the accidental diminisher and that we can end up having a deeply diminishing effect on others while holding the very best of intentions. Mm. Like really trying to be a good leader, a good boss, like, wow, these are people who, who read management books who sign up for management training, who listen to leadership podcasts. These are people like me who write leadership books, who really value good leadership. But despite having good intentions, they're still shutting people down and they have no idea it's going on. That was quite a surprise. I think it's one of the breakthrough things or the value of your work is in that discovery. I mean, I, I think it's everybody can pick out a classic overt diminisher, as you said, like the tyrant and um, and so on. It's more the people are trying hard and, and having negative repercussions. And I think um, the, you've got a lovely survey associated with a book on your website, which gets people to, oh, I did it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, where, what am I doing wrong? I'm like, oh yeah, I've got five out of the nine diminisher, accidental diminisher habits or styles in there, which was, yeah, confronting to discover. I think those who are hungry to learn about themselves and to learn to be better leaders are hungry to know a bit of their shadow, you know, all these, what seemed like good intentions is turning bad. So I'm really curious about how we go about transforming the accidental diminishers into multipliers. And you've got a lot of resources around that. 
What do you think is the first step for people? Well, I think maybe the very, very first step, and maybe this is the first time I've really gotten clear on it, it's just based on the way you said it, is maybe the first step is acknowledging that it's possible, like theoretically possible to have a diminishing effect despite the fact that you're trying to be a good leader. Like understanding that there's a gap between, you know, that that our best intentions can actually have a negative impact. I think a lot of my students are fearful of that, actually. Like um, the ones that I work with want to be good leaders and they're, they're worried that they're not doing a good enough job. <laughs> so I think they're primed to, to discover more, <laughs> which is yeah, a good thing. I find that most leaders have a fairly easy time exploring this idea of accidental diminisher tendencies. Like most of us don't really want to confront the fact that we might just be a bossy bully kind of leader. <laughs> but most of us are willing to entertain this idea that you know, despite good intentions, things can go wrong. And if anyone is a parent, they, they've already sold on this idea because you understand as a parent, like, man, I was trying to be helpful there. But like somehow what I thought was supportive, like good parenting, like had the exact opposite effect. Like um, one that comes to mind is, when uh, my daughter Amanda was in high school, she's a very good student. She's the one of my of four kids that's like wound super, super tight. And, but she was a really good student. She only got A's. I, I never, like if she was getting failing grades, like those papers got thrown out before she ever got home. She only got A's. And so she would come to me like all twisted up about, oh, mom, I've got this big test tomorrow. Let's call it chemistry. You know, I've got this test in chemistry and I'm, oh, I feel like I'm going to fail it. I just like, oh, I'm going to fail this test. And I'd be like, hmm, well, let me see. You only ever get A's. So I actually think you're probably going to do well. Like, Amanda, you're a really good student. You do well on tests. Like, you're going to be fine. She'd be like, oh, oh, you don't like get it. And after a few times, like that, my support of like, you can do this. Like, you're a good student. This is going to go fine. My encouraging optimism. I'm like, wow, it's actually frustrating her. And so I thought, well, let me try something different. So she'd be like, oh, mom, I've got this big test or I have this paper. And I feel like I'm, oh, I'm going to fail. And I'd be like, wow, Amanda, it sounds like you're really unprepared for this test. Like, wow, you might fail this test. This is exactly opposite of what I think I should do. Yeah. And I find myself going, like, what are you doing? Like being so discouraging. And she just stopped and she looked at me like, oh, mom, you're right. You're right. You know what? Like I am unprepared and oh, mom, I got to go. Let me go study. And, and then of course she did well, but I realized that like by being so optimistic, like I wasn't seeing the fact that she was struggling and that she didn't need a pep talk. She didn't need encouragement. She didn't need a reminder that she was brilliant and capable she needed me to acknowledge that she was struggling and she didn't need, need me to fix it for her. She didn't need a study partner. She just needed the acknowledgement. And I'm like, Oh, that's exactly opposite what I would have done. And, and I think it's seeing moments like that where, okay, that could go very wrong. You know, and then I think it's understanding like, Oh, what might be my accidental diminisher tendencies? Like the little quiz might give you some hypotheses, some rocks to like look under, but it's opening up a conversation with your team where you can get people to tell you what you're doing that's being changed in translation. <laughs> that's a nice phrase. You know, of course, if you go to, oh, am I, oh, sorry, no, not you. No, not at all. Of course not. Or if you go to your team, like, oh, am I an accidental diminisher? Oh, no, no, no. But it's asking the question, how might I, with the best of intentions, be having a diminishing impact? It's a really important question. The example you give of being an accidental diminisher by being an optimist is, is actually a really hard one because it, it's a longstanding habit of just like, rah, rah, you can do this. If, if this is one of your things, and it's one of my things as well. It's like, I want to be encouraging. 
one of the suggestions is how to, not to be an optimist that is an accidental diminisher is to sit and acknowledge people's struggle. Do you think there is a time where it's appropriate to be an optimist? I don't think many people want to work for pessimistic leaders. Like we like working for optimists. We just don't like it if that's all they can do. And here's what I've noticed with my own team. For me, my optimism runs really deep. Yeah, I think every performance review I've ever had in my entire career has said, like, can do. Like, I got this. Like, hard thing, send it my way. I can do this. We can do this. What I found is that if I just change the order, and what I do first is I, what I call signal the struggle. Like, you know, guys, what we're doing here is hard. Like, this is going to be a hard one. We are probably going to struggle with this. You know, we might make some mistakes. Like, or even just saying what I'm asking you to do is difficult. And I find that it only takes a few ways to describe that what we're doing is hard. And I know it's hard. And I know this is going to be difficult. That people, like for my team, they're like, okay, thank you, Liz. And then they kind of nod because they know it's coming. But then I say, yeah, but you know what? We can do this. Like we got this. And so they, they don't mind that statement of belief, but they, they want it after I've acknowledged that it's hard. Yeah. Okay. That's good. So that way you don't discard people's stress and anxiety around the situation. Gloss over it. One of the questions I have about this whole idea of helping people become multipliers is one of the struggles I see a lot of CEOs contend with is when they start to really seriously delegate and elevate others, there's this internal resistance that many of them have. And some of it's about letting go of control. And some of it is about ego and status. Like what if somebody's better than I am at doing this? Who am I if I'm not doing all the work and I'm not in control? And they, these are real visceral concerns for people. And they are, they're aware of it. They can sense it. What is your experience around that? Do you find that people have this internal turmoil as they extend themselves into becoming multipliers? Yes, absolutely. And I think you've really hit the the nail on the head with those two issues. There is absolutely this fear most of us have of letting go of control. Like it's a normal human reaction. It's what keeps us safe is to maintain control. And and what I find is that most leaders kind of evolve in this journey naturally, but it can also be helped. I see this as stages. Like the first stage is, no, I need to do it myself. And if I have someone else do it, they're not going to do it right. It's not going to be as good. And I find that if you just get enough data points and you get a few things right on the front end, which I'll come back to, is most leaders find that, okay, you know what? Some people don't do it as well, but there's a lot of people who do it as well. They just do it differently. And so it's opening up, which is, okay, people are going to do it differently than you. You know, if they do it exactly like you, you haven't gotten any scale, any leverage out of your leadership. So it's like, okay, moving from, they're not going to do it right if I put them in charge to, okay, they're going to do it different, but it's okay. Like there are two different ways you can get the same result. And that's not how I would have done it but it got us to the same place. Sort of the next stage is where you give people control and you realize they did it differently than you. That's not how you would have done it. And it's not only as good, it's better. And I find that for like for myself, when I have enough data points of like, oh, my initial reaction is, oh, they didn't do it right. To, okay, they did it different, but that worked. To, oh, they did it different. I would have never thought to do that. And it's so much better than anything I would have done. Like once you get enough data points, you realize that it's not about just like, okay, I'm gonna let some other people in on the fun here. It's, I have to let go of control to get better work and to get broader scale. And one of the ways this very much goes wrong is when people don't do as good a job as a leader would do because the leader hasn't yet told them what a good job looks like. And a lot of people are trying to like shoot in the dark on this. And I find that when the leader can communicate three basic what's, it makes it a lot easier for them to let go of control. 
This is particularly true if you have um, some perfectionist tendencies, like you want it done just exactly right. So the three what's are, you know, when you give someone a piece of work, define what good looks like or great, meaning, you know what, you'll know it's a great job when, you know, it has no typos, when we can compile the code without bugs, when I can take your report and forward it to, you know, someone else without having to make any changes. Like this is what a winning job looks like. That's the first one. What does great look like? Most of us have a picture in our head that we've just never communicated to anyone. Number two, what does done look like? You know, we often give things to people to do and like, oh, they didn't finish the job. You know, what does a good job look like? And what does a complete job look like? Let's think of a simple example. Um, I'll give you one that I've been struggling with here at home, which is my son doing the dishes. Like a good job is like if you've loaded the dishwasher and done a good job, like when the dishes are done, there's no like food debris stuck on anything, like everything's spaced out, it's been rinsed enough. That's what good looks like, is they actually come out clean. A complete job is not only when the dishes are in the dishwasher, but like the extra things, the counters wiped off, there's no remaining um, like pots in the sink. Like that's how you know you're done when the job is complete. So what does great look like? What does complete look like? And what's out of bounds, meaning you don't have to worry about this. Don't get distracted by this or please don't touch this. Like that's not in range. And if you can tell them what the scope is, what great looks like and what done looks like, it's so much easier to let go of control because you've communicated the criteria for doing the great. This is a really fascinating insight because um, as you're describing, what does done look like with the dishes? I think what a lot of new managers and new leaders struggle with is like, don't they know that? <laughs> and am I just being micromanaging? And the thing is, no, they don't. <laughs> or maybe they do, but you need agreement around it. Right. And what happens is most people just assume like, well, obviously everyone knows this is what a good report would look like. But you say report and you might think 20 pages and somebody else thinks a page. Like I remember back when I was at Oracle, I sometimes would say, okay, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a report on this and it involves a staple. <laughs> like with a stapler. And what I was saying is don't give me a paragraph. Like I want enough pages that we're going to need a staple, like not a paperclip, a staple. And it was just saying like, I'm not going to tell you it's 18 pages or eight pages. I'm just saying it's something that's going to need to get a staple in it. And it's a simple way of saying, I want some detail. But anyways, what happens is we just assume other people know what we mean by things. And then when they do it, they don't get it right because they're not mind readers. So we get frustrated. Okay, I have to do it myself. I can't release control. But if we can say, this is the picture in my head. In some ways, what we want is we want leaders who are really clear, bossy, if you will, prescriptive, if you will, about outcomes, but really relaxed about process. Unless you're in some regulatory industry and that process is important, but it's like, hey, here's what, here's what needs to happen. Here's the problem that has to get solved. You find the right solution. We need to hold tight the definition, but like hold loosely the way people go about solving it. Yeah, nice. So it sounds like to me that there are some specific skills that aspiring multipliers need in order to be successful. And you've just described one of them, which is delegation, you know, being very clear around delegation. Are there, are there some fundamental skills from your point of view that are required as a basis to help multipliers be successful? Well, Zoe, I want to address this, the other issue you brought up around status. And I wouldn't call it a basic skill. I would call it a basic state or characteristic that there are a number of people who say, Liz, like, I hear you. Like, I believe, like, I want to be a multiplier leader, but I'm worried what people will think of me. Like, if other people are doing great work and I'm like, if I'm the genius maker, not the genius, like, how am I going to look? And, and I really empathize with that. 
you know, first of all, I think it requires a certain level of confidence in yourself to be able to allow the people around you to be contributing at high levels, for them to not be your underlings, your minions. Even if you've got that confidence, but you're in an environment where it's very harsh, like the environment wants leaders to have all the answers, to kind of be superheroes, there's a lot of things that you can do to manage that. First is we don't want leaders to be like empty headed multipliers. Like we don't want leaders that go, well, I don't know what we should do. What do you all think? Like the best leaders, they bring all of their own intelligence and capability to a team, but they do it in a way that invites everyone else to bring their intelligence. So you're not, I'm not in any way suggesting leaders should become facilitators of a group. Oh, I don't have any opinions. I'm just going to facilitate the discussion. It's like, bring all of your capability, but know, like, know how to play big, but also know how to play small. Like, okay, I'm going to come in big with a definition of what we need to do. I'm going to come in big with a big question that's going to focus the energy and intelligence of the team. I'm going to come in with like a starter idea but then leave all this room for others. And so it's like acknowledging that, no, no, you, like your intelligence, know-how ideas, it matters. Like bring all of that. And so it's reminding ourselves that, okay, I'm not an empty chair here. I get to be smart and capable too. But it's like, how do you play big, but allow other people around you to play big? I think it helps us when it's like, okay, wait a minute. I don't want to be seen as empty headed or weak. And for those of you who work in organizations where, you know, the organization kind of expects the leader to have ideas and to know things on the spot. Like, I think there's some things we can do to signal, here's what I'm doing. Like, you know, this is the work of the team. Here's the role I played. You know, I defined the problem, but my team found the answer. I have framed the vision on this, but I'm leaving enough of it open so that there is room for other people to contribute. So, you know, we don't need to downplay our role. We just don't need to take up all the space. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Don't need to down. I'm just writing this down. Don't need to downplay, but don't need to take up all the space. Love it. So I can't recommend your book, Multipliers, more. I mean, I think it's fantastic. Like I said, I've bought a copy for all of my amplifiers themselves, and we're going to be studying it through this next quarter. And I recommend it to all the listeners of the show to go ahead and get a copy and to take the quiz, the Accidental Diminisher Quiz, and and to watch all your videos too. It's just an enormous amount of resources just on your site. Amazing. I know you've got a new book baby on the way, and it is called, I think... MVP mindset? Is that the draft title or is that the confirmed title? Well, I, I, you were the one who said it was loaded up on Google Books. So I guess that's the title. <laughs> is it building on the work of multipliers? Tell me a little bit about the, the theme, broad theme, if you can. Yeah, I, I can. And as much as I, as a researcher and author, want to like branch out from multipliers and take on whole new problems, it really is in some ways an extension of multipliers because what multipliers looks at is like, what is leadership at its best? And what do leaders do to bring out the best in others? But what I've been exploring in this new book is, well, wait a minute. Yeah, what the leader does matters. But also the way the contributor shows up matters as well. And in some ways, Zoe, this book was born out of a comment someone made. I was teaching some workshop or seminar in multipliers. And there was a manager, it was a tech company. And he's like, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying about being a multiplier. I like it, but but you can't multiply zero. <laughs> and and I was like, is he saying that he's got nothing but dummies on his team? But what he was saying is like, yeah, I can do my part as a leader, but I have to be working with the right kind of talent. And, you know, what I've been looking at is what is it that what is the, like the art of contribution and how does a contributor need to show up 
so that they are able to contribute at their very fullest? Like, what does it take to create um, kind of, an, in my terms, a high contribution workplace where people are really working at 100% of their capability? They're all in. And so I've been looking at what do the most valuable players in the workplace do? And what makes them so extraordinarily valuable on teams? And what can a leader do to build a whole team of people who are thinking and acting in ways that allow them to contribute at their fullest? Essentially, they're the kind of people who are really easy to lead because an ounce of leadership goes a really long way. You don't have to drag great work out of them. You just have to direct them. I love it. I'm really looking forward to this new piece of work. I think it's going to be brilliant. And I think um, an interesting thing, if you're exploring it to discuss as well, is you can have you know a team of stars, but do you have a star team? So are you answering that kind of question? How can you be a great contributor, not only to the purpose of the team, but to each other as a collective? Is that one of the aspects that you're researching? Well, the last chapter of the book is called Building an All-Star Team. And so it's saying- Oh, cool. How do you how do you not just get one MVP on the team? How do you get an entire team thinking and acting this way? And in some ways for leaders, it's this idea of how do you take the work attitude and sort of the work ethics of your absolute superstars and make that infectious on a team? Fantastic. <laughs> everyone brings their own unique skills to it, but their way of thinking and working, it really is about a set of assumptions of the, the highest contributors in the workplace, like a way that they think and work that's very different than everyone else. What's one of those assumptions? Oh, you know, one of the assumptions, let me start with one of the most basic is this idea of the most valuable contributors don't do their job. They do the job that needs to get done. The, you know, their, their mind oh, nice. is, I am here to serve. Like, you know, a lot of people have this kind of a duty mindset, which is I have a job to do. This is my job and I do my job. And, and it was interesting talking to managers. There were so many managers who said, you know, I'll give you like one of my example, one of my typical contributors, they're super talented. They're super smart. They do their job so well, but they do their job. And then when they would describe one of their extraordinarily valuable people, they would say, you know what they, they do like in my terms here, the job that needs to be done. Meaning when there's a messy problem that like falls through the cracks, it's no one person's job. They're like, Oh, I'll go do that. Fantastic. It's kind of like an experience I had early in my career, I was interviewing for this job inside of Oracle. And um, I had had about a year and a half there and had done some really good work and probably had a good reputation. And in this interview, I'm telling the vice president what I thought I could do for the group. And, you know, I described how we actually, you know, the company needed some management training and I could do that. It was a real passion of mine. And he, he said, you know, Liz, we're so excited to have you join this group. And, you know, I agree with you. That seems really important. But right now your boss has a different problem that she's trying to solve. She's trying to figure out how to get like thousands of people ramped up on Oracle technology. What would be great is if you helped her solve that problem, which is how I ended up working as a technical trainer. They're like, our company right now doesn't need management training. We need product training. And so I'm like, wow, I have no background in that. That's not what I want to do. But if that's what needs to be done, then I'm going to make myself useful. Like what, what Bob was saying to me is like, Liz, you know what? Why don't you, like, instead of making yourself so smart and so excited, why don't you make yourself useful? <laughs> Love it. I'm like, oh, nobody really cares about me and what I want to do. Managers need problem solved. And so it really set my intention very early on in my career, which is, oh, I'm not going to be a job holder. I'm just going to go be a problem solver. That's probably an example. It seems like such a basic thing, but it's an orientation 
that provides extraordinary value back to leaders. Just this willingness to like, I'll go do the job that needs to be done right now. That's fantastic. Thank you for giving us that little snapshot insight into your forthcoming book. I'm excited to see it out in the world. You're the first person who's asked me about it. (laughs) Yay. A bit of fame. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing all of your wonderful wisdom and insight and your wealth of experience and expertise. It's been just glorious having you. Well, thank you for, for being interested in it. And thank you for the work you're doing, building great leaders across Australia, like the whole country. (laughs) Uh, Yes, we're building an empire slowly. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. I had to stop myself not fangirling all over poor old Liz. Uh, She was just fabulous to interview, really lovely human and really dedicated to her work and so much energy about her. One of the things or a couple things I'm taking out of this interview are about not being a job holder, being a problem solver. And I think that is a really useful frame for anybody who wants to be a high performing contributor. And I love that. That's the focus of her next book. Another thing I'm taking out of this is not to be a facilitator as a leader, not to be an empty shell. Not that facilitators are empty shells, (laughs) but that's sort of what she was saying, right? Like, don't pretend you're a blank slate. You come to the table with all your genius and experience as well. And the thing is, is to make space for not only your stuff, but everybody else's genius stuff. I think that's really important. And the third thing that's really useful for me in particular, because being an optimist is one of my accidental diminisher habits, I guess, is don't have that as the only string to your bow, the only note that you play in your range. And that we need to be optimistic and be able to name the truth and to speak of the challenge, to name the challenge or to signal the struggle, as Liz said. And I think that's really been useful for me as well. All right. Love to hear what you got out of the show. Feel free to email me, zoe at innercompass.com.au. Drop me a note on LinkedIn. I'm there all the time, too. Or rate and review the podcast. It helps us get the message out so we can attract really amazing people even more amazing people just like Liz. Okay, thanks. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast with leadership expert, Zoe Routh. For more about people stuff and to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com.